Hello and welcome to the third lecture in the Asian Development Bank 3IE video lecture series. My name is Annette Brown and I will be talking to you today about randomized control trials or RCTs. In this lecture I'm going to start by picking up where Howard White left off in his lecture where he talked about using a counterfactual in order to measure impact. We'll start by looking at when does a comparison group not give you that valid counterfactual. Then I'll talk a bit about what the sources of selection bias are, what is an RCT and what is not an RCT, and then I'll look at some approaches to randomized assignment and finish about, by talking about what some of the common concerns are about randomized control trials and what some remedies might be. So here's an example. In Colombia, there was a program that was designed to give skills to young people in urban settings. This program, Jovenis and Axion, included three components. The first was three months of classroom training. It also included three months of on-the-job training and a daily cash transfer to cover transportation expenses. Let's look at the results. As you can see for women, there was a program group and a comparison group. Before the intervention, the labor force participation rate in paid employment of these women was roughly the same. But after the intervention, you can see in the red that the women who were in the program had a higher rate of paid employment. For the men, things are a little bit different. Before the program, the program group and the comparison group actually had slightly different levels of paid employment. And after the program, they had similar levels. So the question is, can we compare these groups or use the comparison between these program and comparison groups in order to measure the net impact of the program? Well, what might be different between the program group and the comparison group that would matter in this situation? First, we think that there are many characteristics which are indeed observable that can make a difference. People have different levels of education going into training as well as going into employment different ages, household characteristics, and also parents' education. But we also think that there are characteristics that are unobservable that vary across individuals that can also make a difference. These might include an individual's intrinsic motivation or drive to receive education or training, but also to be in paid employment. People may have different inherent capabilities, and people may receive different support or encouragement from those at home or their peers. So when do differences like this matter? Well, observable and unobservable characteristics matter when they influence both program participation and the final outcomes from their program. When those characteristics are different, and in particular, when they look different in the program group and the, com and the comparison group, we call, this is what we call selection bias. So what is selection bias? If there are participants and non-participants, then some kind of selection process has to have happened in order to create those two groups. One process is what we call self-selection. This happens when participants choose themselves whether or not to participate in a program or an intervention. And we think that they typically make that decision based on their own individual anticipated gains. We also see program placement selection. In this case, a third party decides who participates in the program or not, and this is usually based on some kind of observable characteristics. Now, when selection is made based on self-selection or program placement selection, it is almost always the case that there are differences between the program group and the comparison group, and this is what we call selection bias. When we have selection bias, that means we do not have a valid counterfactual for measuring net impact. Or, in essence, we're comparing apples to oranges. Okay, so what is an RCT? A randomized control trial is one approach to address selection bias. And most people think that this is the best approach to addressing selection bias. People call RCTs by other names, which include things like experiment, randomized experiment, randomized evaluation. Now, an RCT is when you use random assignment of a program or intervention in order to create a counterfactual comparison group. Random assignment balances the distribution of both the observable and the unobservable characteristics 
over the program and comparison groups. It's important to remember here that it's not about having the same individuals or the same types of individuals in the program and comparison, but rather what you're balancing is the distribution of these characteristics across the program group and the comparison group. When you truly have random assignment, then there is no selection bias and you have a valid counterfactual. So let's see how a randomized control trial gives us that balance. Suppose that this is your study sample, a group of individuals who may or may not participate in the program and whom you want to study. If we use random assignment to place the people into the program group or the comparison group, so you might think of a simple coin flip, you could get an assignment that looks like this. Well, what do these two groups look like? You can see that the program group has five men and four women, and the comparison group has five men and five women. So the two are roughly balanced. We can look at other characteristics. So what about education? In the program group, we have five people with post-secondary education, two people with secondary education, and two students. Whereas in the comparison group, we have something very similar. Five people with post-secondary education, two people with secondary education, and three students. This is what we think of as being balanced. Now, what isn't an RCT? It's important to remember that random sampling, although often an important part of your study as well, is not the same thing as random assignment. It's not an RCT. And we can look at this with the same example. So again, we have the same study sample, but let's suppose that there's self-selection instead. And due to self-selection, we have this program group and this comparison group. Now, evaluators may come in and say, we want to take a random sample of this group in order to run a survey and compare the program and the comparison groups. So let's suppose that our random sample looks like this. Given that random sampling, what do our program and comparison groups look like? Well, here's the balance. We see now that in the program group, we have five people with secondary post-secondary education and one person with secondary education, whereas in the comparison group, we have only one person with post-secondary education, two with secondary, and two students. These groups are very different. And comparing the impact of the program on this program group with those who are in the comparison group is not a valid counterfactual, is not a valid way of looking at what impact the intervention would have on the overall population. Let's look at some real world examples. The first is a study of a mobile savings program in Sri Lanka. In this case, there were multiple types of the program that the researchers wanted to look at. That is, there were different prices that they wanted to test for this particular service. And so they randomly assigned individuals into several different treatments, one treatment being zero cost, and then slightly higher costs, and a control group. We can look at the balance of the characteristics among all of these treatment and the control groups in the baseline before the intervention took place. Now here, we just have three of those groups, but you can see that on average, the individuals are about 40 years of age, a uh, little under 20% are women, and roughly 85% are married. And this is very similar across these three different randomly assigned treatment groups. Let's look at another example. This one is from China, where the intervention is trying to uh, motivate improved nutrition through the schools in order to reduce anemia. Now here, the random assignment occurred at the level of the schools. 85 schools were originally enrolled. Some were not used in the end, but there were four randomly assigned groups, one control group and three different treatments. Again, we can look at the balance table at baseline in order to see that the random assignment gave us groups that were very easy to compare. Okay, across all four groups, there's roughly a hemoglobin level of 12 and an age of 123 to 124 months. Now with this balance, we're able to easily compare the results and analyze the results at the end. So there's a clear increased hemoglobin level for one of the three treatments, the incentive treatment, and a clear reduction in anemia also for that same treatment. Now there's something else that's important to notice about these two different examples that I gave. In the first one, the randomization was at the level of the individual, 
and the outcome measurement was at the level of the individual. We might think of this as the most basic type of RCT design. In the second one, the researchers used what we call a cluster randomized design. So even though the outcome was measured at the level of the student or the individual, the random assignment happened at the level of the school. Now here that made sense because the intervention was also school-based, but many times randomization can be done at that level as a way to make it easier to employ randomized assignment. So let me go forward a little bit and talk about some other approaches to random assignment. First of all, we can use random assignment as a rationing device when a program is oversubscribed or resources are limited. This gives us the benefit of having a fair way of assigning a program in a resource limited setting, as well as a way to test the impact of that program. We can also use random assignment as a way to schedule the rollout of a program over time. And then we can compare the randomly assigned group to first receive the program against the group that is waiting to receive the program at a later date. As I mentioned, we can randomize over clusters rather than over individuals. That can make the randomization process simpler, but also allow us a powerful RCT design. And finally, sometimes we have interventions that are very hard to keep from a control group, like a media intervention, for example. And here, it's often possible to use what we call an encouragement design, where the encouragement is randomly assigned, and we compare those who have a higher probability of receiving the program or the treatment against a comparison group that has a lower probability of receiving the treatment. There are some common concerns around randomized control trials. The first is that people often think that randomized control trials are very expensive. The cost of all these studies vary quite widely. And in any case where you're going to have a rigorous evaluation, there do need to be dedicated resources. But we have found at 3IE that randomized control trials are not necessarily any more expensive than quasi-experimental designs, and there are methods for doing low-cost or rapid impact evaluations. Some people suggest that random assignment is not always possible, particularly for certain development sectors or in certain settings. Well, we've seen, particularly over the most recent 10 years, that RCTs have been conducted successfully in all development sectors and in a variety of settings, including those where you have an emergency response situation or a fragile or conflict-affected state. Finally, some people argue that random assignment is not ethical, that in development we want to make sure that we're targeting our resources to those groups that need it the most. At the same time, we have to remember that in development, it's almost always the case that we cannot help everybody we want to. And many people feel that the random assignment of a program, either overall or phased in over time, is a more ethical way of determining who gets those resources earlier, and that it's also more ethical to be able to implement programs in a way that allows us to test their actual benefit. So that's the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you have found it useful in learning about randomized control trials. I now urge you to take the quiz associated with this lecture at the end of this video. Mm -hmm.